Okay. There we are. All right. Okay, Jerry. Now we've we've got Jerry in with us here. That's fine. Okay, I'm going to start the webinar. Okay. I'm only there because I've been logged in. Hey, Jerry, how are you? Good. This right. is SSCA. We're doing a webinar with Jerry Ostermiller and Douglas Cochran, and his wife has joined us. And we're streaming live on YouTube. We've had the usual challenges of doing in across the US Zoom uh, meeting of Zoom being up, Zoom being down, and links. But we're going to present a wonderful uh, discussion about the Columbia and Snake River from crossing the bar to going up to different areas, stopping, anchoring, information about the dams, and much more. Jerry, who is up at your on the screen right now, it looks like he's in his workshop, um, is a marine archaeologist, or a marine archaeologist, and was very involved in the museum in Astoria, the Maritime Museum. Actually, getting that, I don't know how he fit the boat in there, but he got the boat in there. He has been up and down the rivers, a speaker, a lecturer, um, absolutely a fascinating person to know. And Douglas is our SSCA host for in Washington State in, and uh, very familiar with the, the Columbian Snake River. You have been sent some video, um, or not video, but files and Jerry's bio in our links to you. I'm going to turn this over to Douglas at this point where he's going to guide you up the Columbian Snake River and with Jerry. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you, or not see you, because I can't see you, but you can see me. But, uh, Joan, if you could uh, share my screen for me. Uh, actually, I do it here. Let me hang on. I'm going to share a screen. OK, is that coming through correctly? Yes, it is. We can see the United States, and we can see the West Coast of the United States. Good. Now, what I, where I want to start with this is kind of give you a perspective of, of what we're, we're discussing here. So I'm showing you the entire west coast of the United States from, from up here at the uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca, all the way down through Washington, Oregon, California, and down here is San Diego and the Mexican border. That's a, approximately 1,400 miles uh, from end to end. This little jog here in the middle is the Columbia River. That's for the Columbia and the Snake. They break right here. And that's about 425 miles one way. So we're talking about an 850 mile uh, side trip when you go up the Columbia, if you're passing by. So it's, it's not a trivial thing where you go, oh, I'll take a couple of days and do this. When Jerry and I did it, we took the whole summer. We spent two months going up. We spent one month going back. Now, if we're... We're not type A people, or at least we pretend we aren't. So we took the t took our time and gunk hold along, spent time in places. Uh, James and, and Jennifer Hamilton on Dorona did the same thing a few years ago. They took two weeks going up and one week coming back. So they uh, definitely uh, did it a little faster than we did. So that gives you kind of an idea of where we're where where we're heading on this kind of a, a of a venture. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to get to the Columbia River because before you can go up the Columbia River, you have to get there. And if you're coming up from San Francisco, that's uh, roughly 750 miles, not a few miles. So it's about four and a half days of cruising. And since it's important to reach the Columbia Bar at a time when you can pass through it safely, that's a, a bit of a challenge to try to make that run uh, all the way. So what I would recommend doing is, is stopping someplace and I'm gonna recommend uh, Newport, which is right in this area right here. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, if you're coming from the north, up here is Seattle uh, and the Puget Sound and the San Juan Islands and the whole beautiful Canadian waters. 
if you come out of that area of, from Nia Bay, which is right out at the point of, of uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, peninsula out here, when you leave the, when you leave the Strait of Juan de Fuca into the ocean, Nia Bay is your last port. And from there uh, down to, to uh, the Columbia Bar is about 164 miles. So that's typically about a 24 hour trip. So again, it's easier to time than it is coming from San Francisco, but you do have a potential stopover right here in Westport, which would give you a, a chance to rest and then also uh, align your timing for the bar. So let's talk a little bit about Newport, just as an example of this. So this is the Yakina Bay is where Newport, Oregon is. And the reason I'm gonna talk about this is, is uh, because it's probably the easiest bar crossing in the whole uh, West Coast. It's, it's very short, it's uh, well protected, and it's typically the last bar on the, at least in the Pacific Northwest that will close in, in bad conditions. Now that's not always true. Of course, it will close at times too. So here's, here's what the bar looks like for those of you who haven't ever been in here. It's basically, this is the river mouth coming out here. And then there's, there's two uh, jetties. The North jetty is right here. The South jetty is right here. And what those do is they form a protected channel uh, coming into the bar. So with the prevailing winds being from the Northwest, generally the North jetty is breaking the, uh, the, the wave pattern so you can safely get in. Now, I mentioned bar closings happen. Now, so, sometimes they'll happen only part of the day. And there's times when it's safe to go in and there's times when it's not. And what, what determines that is, is the tide flows coming in and out. So if, if, the, if the waves are breaking across the bar, uh, the Coast Guard will close the bar and they close it in stages. First, they close it to small craft and then they close it to larger craft. And then eventually if it gets stormy enough, they don't allow even the ships to come in. So, so let's talk about that just a little bit. I'm gonna kind of give a thumbnail sketch of, of what drives all these forces. And then Jerry's gonna talk about the Columbia bar, which is, is the, a very challenging bar. And he'll tell you a lot more details about how all this works. But basically what we're looking at is that there's a river flowing in that's making this great big uh, lake here. And then the river flows out through the entrance. So if there was nothing else impacting it, what came out of the bottom here would be about the same as what comes in the top, which is a fairly lazy river. But instead with the tides, the tides in this area run six to eight feet uh, typically. And so if you think about this huge amount of water being filled six, six or eight feet deeper, that's a whole lot of water that's pouring into this little channel here and then it pours back out. So during, during the flood tide, the water comes in and fills this whole bucket up with water. And then during the ebb, it all flows back out. So during the ebb, you not only have the, the river water itself, which is a lot of water, but you also have the entire ebb of the, of the bay coming out and it makes for a, a very strong current running out and it's meeting the winds and the waves and, and it makes for very exciting conditions. But it, as, the, as the water is flooding in, as the tide floods in, it can almost cancel the, the uh, flow out of the river and it simply makes a much calmer situation. So if you can go in in the last hour or two of the flood tide, or ideally right at the slack, the high slack, then it's a, typically the best time you can, you can go across there. So catching that, that time is really important. So when, you, when you're leaving from other, any port, planning to cross a river bar at the other end of your journey, you wanna make sure to time that accurately it's always easier to go back out than it is to come in. For one thing, you've been in there and you're rested. And so you, 
you have a chance to leave at your leisure. You can also sit back in this protected area and watch the bar and see what's happening. If there's breaking waves on one side or the other, or some other, uh, you know, if it's, it's unruly, you can sit there and if you decide you don't like it, you can turn around and go back to your dock. So if, if you're having to time your, your uh, arrival someplace else, it's generally better to time it uh, there and, and take your chances as you're leaving. Because you can really, even if you go out in rougher conditions, you're going into the bow wave and you're getting the bow waves, not, not stern waves, but you're much easier to handle. If, worst case is you power your way through. And this is a pretty typical bar because there's, there's just this little area right here where, where the breaking waves will happen. So typically your, your entrance is gonna be about 100 or 200 feet long. You might have two or three waves that you have to contend with and you get through that and you're inside the protected waters and you run on up. Uh, this is a beautiful bridge here and then, then the, the South Beach Marina is right here. So that it's a really good bar to come into because you're only a mile in, inside to, before you're at the guest docks. There's fuel there. There's a big long side tie for, for guests. So it's a, a great place to come into. So when you leave then, another issue you have to be concerned about when you're passing through this area is crab pots. There are lots and lots of crabbers. And so what happens is that it's very easy to get tangled up in their lines. So you'll see that, that typically, let me run this up just a little ways here. All these red lines are, are uh, routes that we've taken coming in or going out. So we typically run out to a hundred fathom line uh, to get out past the, the uh, uh, crab pots before we turn north. Let me see if I can get this. So now you can see what, what our typical route is when we're heading out of Newport, heading north. As we, we come out of the bar, we head more or less northwest until we get out to around the 100 fathom line and then we start turning north. So as I say, from, from Newport, it's, a, it's about a, a 15 to 20 hour trip or something like that to the Columbia bar, depending on your boat speed. And uh, when you get there, Let's just zoom in here. Your destination is the CR buoy, which is right here. So you can see that there are, there are buoys marking the channel coming in, and this is where you enter the bar. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry, who has been across this bar so many times he can't remember how many times that is. I want to mention that Jerry and I have been friends since uh, our school days. And so if we seem like we're overly friendly, it's, it's well earned. We've, we've had a lot of great experiences together. So Jerry, tell them everything you know. <laughs> okay. Um, I, Doug's been pretty thorough about the basics of how bar crossings work. <clears throat> and I am assuming that uh, all of you that are watching this are pretty experienced mariners, and so some of this may be redundant. But um, the mechanics of, of bar crossing um, are the same almost anywhere in the world. Uh, the, the goal is to get everything working for you, and there's optimum times to go through and difficult times to go through. The Columbia River bar is, uh, is rated as uh, one of the most serious bars uh, in the nation for commercial traffic. And the reason for that is that it's a long time passage. When you look at this chart, uh, once you leave the CR buoy and you, you start running northeast and the winds in the summer are usually out of the northwest. So they'll be on your, uh, on your port beam. And in the winter, they're from the southwest. Uh, and uh, so those are things to contend with. And then once you get in between the jetties, and uh, there's a north jetty and a south jetty. And, and by the way, the, the, these uh, bar crossings are very, very well marked. Coast Guard is, and the Army Corps of Engineers have spent millions and millions of dollars uh, making this 
uh, predictable navigation channel that uh, any anyone with a little bit of experience can easily do. Just simple red right returning and you're in good shape. But uh, you're in that area um, for quite a while. If, if you look at that curve, it looks like a, uh, an inverted V that goes all the way across and in starts going south east. That whole area is, is, the, is considered the bar. So you can easily be doing bar crossing with all those variables that Doug explained uh, for a half an hour or, or even more. So that's why it's really important to get your timing down pretty good. Um, the idea of having uh, a low tide and all that water running down it, it just increases the velocity of the water tremendously. And if that comes against prevailing winds that are coming out of the out of the west, then that's what creates the standing waves. I've crossed the bar at 15 foot standing waves. I've been out there with the Coast Guard as a guest uh, on their 47 foot motor light boats and uh, to having an e-ticket ride or two in 25 and 30 foot waves. So it can get pretty nasty. On the other hand, with a little bit of planning and a little bit of thought, uh, it, it could be pretty easy. I had a little 22 foot sailboat, a little uh, uh, sloop, and uh, I would single hand it from Astoria all the way out to the CR buoy and back. Every spring is a little rite of passage for me. But I understood the, the bar pretty well by that time. And I would like to get, a, I'd like to cross it in the morning when there's not much wind. And uh, I, I would leave the protected area about mid, mid uh, tide rising or maybe just a little bit later than that. So I have plenty of time uh, if I have any issues uh, to deal with that. North of the channel, straight above where, uh, where Doug's uh, finger is pointing is Cape Disappointment. And Cape Disappointment is, is a huge Coast Guard facility. There's a lighthouse up there and it's manned with, an ob ob with a full-time observer and uh, radio uh, channel 16, you can call a Coast Guard at Cape D, as the lo locals call it, Cape D, and they'll come right back to you and probably ask you to move to 22 or something. And you can get a bar report with all the details, the swells, the current, et cetera, uh, whether or not it's got any issues that you need to be concerned about. And they're really friendly and they really, uh, they, they appreciate people, uh, you know, having, having a good, technique that to, to just touch bases with the Coast Guard. There's also a lot of assets there. There's a, a National Motor Lifeboat School where they do all the training for the whole nation is right there. So there's lots of people and equipment. And then there's a Coast Guard station with a half a dozen 47 foot motor lifeboats. And uh, if you have any, you know, an engine casualty or a steering casualty or something happens, uh, they'll come right out and get you and they'll hit you up and they'll tow you into safety, no problem. So, yes, it's, it, it's something to be considerate about, but again, if you follow um, the, the techniques that we described, you should have no problem at all. Uh, the other thing you need to know is that there's a lot of heavy, deep, traf deep draft traffic on the entire Columbia River system, all the way to Portland for sure. And uh, we have anchorages out in front of Astoria of maybe uh, you know, 10 or 11 deep draft vessels on both sides of the channel on a regular basis. And because it's a federal waterway, uh, there's some really good things. Uh, one of them is it's very well marked. There's ranges all along it and there's day markers and buoys all along it. So uh, it, you can be pretty relaxed and just run the red side in and you're gonna be in pretty good shape. The other thing is that they designated channel 13, channel 13, as a contact, a bridge to bridge contact for river navigation. So if you're, uh, if you're out and about and uh, you really wanna monitor both 16 and 13 on the cold Columbia River system all the way to Idaho. And uh, that'll take care of you pretty doggone well. Uh, the deep draft guys, if they have a question about your intentions, they'll call you. And, uh, uh, and if they don't get you on 16, they'll call you on 13 or vice versa. 
And I, I usually call them to let them know what my intentions are because the pleasure boats, um, you know, they're not all as good mariners as you guys are. <laughs> so they don't know. And uh, when I contact them and say, you know, I don't need very much water, I'm over on this side or whatever, uh, they're fine with that. And in fact, they're really appreciated and always say thank you. And you can also ask them if they pick any up on the radar or whatever. And then one other thing about navigating uh, the river system is, uh, you know, most of our chart plotters, we have AIS, Automatic Identification System. And there are shore stations all along uh, to Portland, Oregon, uh, where those are relayed. And so you've got very good coverage. And if I see a deep draft vessel coming down around a corner of a bend and not in direct visual contact, but on the chart, I usually click on it and get the name of the vessel and call them and just let them know, you know, where I'm coming and uh, everybody's really happy with that. So that's about it for coming in. There's a big giant bridge that goes from Astoria to the state of Washington right there. It's about 200 feet high, so you have no problem clearing it from the water and the channel. Everything's well lit and marked. And then just to the right of is it that right where that little nick is in the, in the uh, peninsula uh, in Astoria is uh, the world famous Columbia River Maritime Museum. And I had the great honor of being the executive director and president of that museum for uh, 20 years, and it's a dandy. Uh, it's nationally accredited, first nationally accredited maritime museum on the West Coast. It, it, collections are fabulous, 70,000 square feet, new, and modern, and, uh, and, and really worth a visit. In fact, I think I can click on that, Doug. Let's see here. You need to share your screen, I think. Yeah, Doug, you need to drop your share. Let me drop. You're going to have to kill it for me, Joan, because I, I have, have, don't have that ability. There you go. Oh, okay. I guess, I guess I do. Now, Jerry, go and share your screen at the very bottom. Okay. And I'll just do this little PowerPoint thing for you really quick. This is the museum I'm telling you about, Columbia River Maritime Museum. And it's a multi-million dollar facility. You can see that the roofs, the architecture uh, mimics the standing waves on the Columbia River bar. Jerry, uh, and, you can't yes. to share your screen. You need to go to the green share screen at the bottom, click on that, it will bring up your share. It's not coming through? No. Try it again. There's a button in the lower right you need to click, I think. It says share. After you, you, you have to click twice. Oh, okay. Um, does that work? There you go. That's working. Great. Okay, now we're in. Now you can see the museum building now? Yes. Okay, anyway, the, the architecture reflects the standing waves of the Columbia River Bar. And it's all modern. Uh, it's 70,000 square feet. Across the street from this is uh, almost a two city blocks worth of storage, a visible storage of all of our boat collections. I, have, I collected 150 small craft that are all related to the Pacific Northwest. And uh, that's also part of our campus. And we usually have a cruise ship or two tied up at our own dock, plus a Coast Guard 210 foot cutter. Uh, two of them are home pointed here. And so usually one or the other is there. And then we have as our collections, um, the Lightship Columbia, uh, which is the last uh, floating lighthouse that marked the entrance to the bar uh, in service. And we own that too, and that's part of our, our program. Um, entering into the front desk, uh, the gals uh, that work here are really nice and friendly. And uh, across the main entry level is a big chart. And uh, there's quite a bit of history about uh, 
different famous shipwrecks. Uh, although we, we, it's not anywhere near as dangerous now with the Coast Guard and all of the modern improvements. Uh, in the old days, it was for 250 years, there was a couple thousand uh, vessels lost there, including some big freighters. And that's why they fixed it up really nice. Um, this was the last exhibit that I put in. Uh, this is a Coast Guard 44 foot motor lifeboat. And uh, uh, that was a, a real fun exhibit. It meant a lot to me because I spent quite a bit of time with the Coast Guard. In fact, I, I was a senior officer in the auxiliary here and a liaison for uh, Sector Columbia River for about three years as a side interest. Uh, but this took me about five years and three trips to Washington, D.C. to get the Commandant to give me this boat. And uh, I hired an exhibit designer from, uh, actually from Walt Disney Studios and I made him go through the National Motor Lifeboat School to see how to set it up right. This is not an exaggeration. This is the bar at its worst. And uh, I made absolutely certain that this is history, not Hollywood. And I had all the instructors of the National Motor Lifeboat School come in when we were setting this up and assured me that, yes, this is what it's like out there, absolutely. So again, the importance of timing. It can be a lake if you time it right. So anyway, that's the museum. And uh, Astoria, um, by the way, is the oldest American city west of the Rockies. And uh, it was the big port before uh, Portland, which is about a hundred and some miles up the river uh, was established. So Doug, uh, you wanna take it away? Yep, I will. So I'm gonna share my screen again. We're gonna go back to the charts. You see that okay? Yep, looks perfect. There's Astoria. Yep, so this is the big bridge going across the river. The uh, channel is in, in, at the south side of the, of the river. And this is a West Bay Marina here. And that's the, the place where the transient boats are most welcome. It's got plenty of room uh, generally for, for even for big boats. So let's say we've come in here, we've been tourists. There's a, also a great England's supply here. So it's a good place to pick up your parts for your boat because we all know that cruising is really just another word for fixing boats in fancy places. So <laughs> that, there's an England's right here by the marina that is very, very good, very well stocked. So let's just head up the river a little ways. Now, Jerry mentioned briefly that these ranges, or they call them reaches here on the river, but uh, they, uh, almost the whole river is laid out in straight lines and they're called a reach. So if we look here, this is the Tansy Point reach here. So it goes from, from this point up to this point and it's marked by lights on one end or the other. So in this case, you'll see a light here and a light here and if those are lined up, what those are is, is storyboards. So they're an orange board with a black stripe in it and one's behind and above the other one. If those are lined up, you're running right down the middle of the reach. If they get off one side or the other, then you need to turn in, a, in the direction, whatever direction to line them back up to run down the middle. So that makes it easy to, to stay on course uh, other than the fact that, that all of us are little fleas compared to the big ships. So the big ships are gonna come right down the middle of that. And we need to make sure that we're not there. We wanna make sure we're someplace out of their way because they take a mile to stop and, and they really object to, to uh, scratching their bows on fiberglass. So, so as we leave the uh, area, I'm gonna zoom out here. The, the whole way up the river is, is very neatly laid out in, in about 25 to 35 mile segments, which is very nice for, for us because it, it means unless you're in a real hurry, you can, uh, you can uh, make easy days of most of it. Now this lower part of the river here, you can see it's very wide. When you're out there, it looks like it's a lake or it looks like a small ocean but it's quite shallow in a lot of places. So you wanna make sure you stay near the channel. And it's also affected by the tides quite a bit up through this area. So here's, here's the first uh, place that I like to stop is, is Kath Lamet. This is a, a real cute little place. 
you can see that it's extremely well protected because you come around this green marker up this little narrow channel and then do a 180 into the docks here. And then the whole village here of Kath Lambert is a, a very pleasant place to stop. You, you might want to spend a, a couple of nights there just because it's so pleasant. And as you can see, it's really protected. So that, that makes it nice. Zoom out here a little bit. Now, you can see that uh, there's two channels here. Let me zoom out a little more. So we, we brought our 46 down this way when we went up the river. It was in the spring and there was a lot of water. But Jerry tells me that now this, uh, this has not been dredged at all. And he's recommending that we come back out and do the main channel if, when you come down this way. Uh, dredging on the on the Columbia and the Snake is is a serious problem. When when they talk about needing infrastructure improvements, dr dredging the river has been a major major problem. In fact, at one point we we uh, moored next to one of the Coast Guard buoy tenders and had the the captain aboard for a glass of wine and. He took our charts and marked them all up. Said, the channel doesn't go here, it goes here. There's a sandbar here because it, it, it's always changing. So it's, it's good to be really a, uh, pay attention to things and especially the notices to mariners that talk about the problems like, you know, every once in a while a barge will get loose or something like that. And that, that gets exciting. So after, after Kath Lamet, you have various options. Uh, the river continues along here. You'll see that it goes across the channel goes across the river from side to side quite often. And this is we get part way up now you'll notice let me point out something here. We'll just uh, you see right here it, they have the river marked in five mile segments. So this is the statute miles 65 miles from the mouth of the of the bar. And back here is the 60 mile marker. So here at 65 miles is there's a very high bridge and there's a lot of, of uh, heavy shipping in this area. So typically you'll see a lot of ships. Uh, I came across that just a couple of day, days ago and they had three or four or five ships uh, within eyesight of the bridge. I'm just gonna zoom down here a little ways. Jerry and Doug, I'm going to remind people that this is being recorded and we will let it go over time because it's recorded and they can, we'll get copies of the link and they can see it after the fact or they can watch it on YouTube. It's being live streamed. And you, you notice that the river now has changed instead of going from west to east, it's made a turn and now it's running north towards south. That's part of this same stress pattern on the continental plate that created Juan de Fuca Strait, where it's being dragged, the plate is being dragged uh, 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 offset. And then when you get down to Portland, it turns and goes west again. So you've got this vertical spot, um, which is north-south. So it's it's very interesting river. And uh, it's one of, the, one of the most enjoyable rivers I've ever been on from the standpoint of exploring it. Uh, every 25, 30 miles, it, it changes its entire personality. And there's a lot of choices about how you go. You can do side channels uh, that have their own personality, and, or you can, you can go in the main channel and, and a short path, you know, if you're in a hurry to get somewhere. But that whole lower Columbia River from Bonneville Dam, which is the first dam you'll come to, to the, uh, uh, to the mouth is uh, tidal. And uh, in the spring, there's a lot of water coming down. So it's easiest to maneuver it, you know, later in the summer. But nevertheless, it's, it's e pretty easy to navigate um, all the time. And by the way, there's a, a chart atlas. I don't know if you can see this on the screen. Hold this up. But there's a chart atlas that you can buy at any Mariner Supply 
that is chucky jam full of every single chart and all of the amenities, where to get fuel, where to get groceries, what the stores are, uh, phone numbers for all that information. And it's, it's like a, a Mariner's Bible for the Columbia River. And it goes all the way to Lewiston, Idaho, and, and in some big side channels uh, that we'll talk about later. Jerry, what's the name of that chart again? It's, it's called the River Cruising Atlas, and it's printed by Evergreen Pacific, Columbia, Willamette, and Snake Rivers. And it's, uh, I, I like it because I can mark it all up with, uh, you know, notes and highlighters and stuff. And uh, I, I usually look at my next day's travel and go, okay, if something happened, where's, where's a good place to anchor and, and that sort of thing. It's all in there. And you can get it at England Marine Supply in Astoria. They're about, uh, about 35 bucks. But uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's a great, great resource. Even if you have a chart plotter, just for looking ahead, it's a great resource. Yes, it's it's much handier because a chart plotter, as you can see with what I'm doing, it's hard to get a real overview, whereas that book gives you a, a big overview plus down to, to real fine detail. So here at St. Helens, this is at mile post 85. This is one place where the river splits. Now, if you're a type A personality and you like bashing your way against the current, you take the main current up to Portland. But if you're a, a into lazy river cruising, you cut off here. Now, this is a very nice place to spend the night. This, this here is Sand Island, and there's a dock right here, so you can get off and have a little kind of a quiet time. Or you can go over to St. Helens, which is a, a smallish town, and they have guest docks there. But what happens right at this point here is the Multnomah Channel separates from, from the main channel. And let me just show you, it, it goes down a long ways. It just winds its way through farmlands and, and uh, swamps. And there's a lot of eagles and, and other uh, wildlife there. And it's, it's the closer you get to Portland, the more you'll see houseboats and there's, there's hundreds of houseboats along there. They're just fascinating, beautiful craft. Now that is a slow trip because it's, uh, it's all slow bell, you, you are five knots or less to get through there because otherwise you'd be rocking the houseboats around and they would not like that at all. But I highly recommend it, especially when going upriver because there's quite a bit of current on, on the main channel and it can get, there's a lot of fetch, so you can get a lot of wind over there. But Multnomah Channel is just this bucolic, quiet water area. Then here you can see, this is the Willamette River coming down. The Willamette starts up in the mountains of the Cascades and comes down through Eugene and Corvallis and Salem. And uh, in fact, I've sailed that too. That was a, a lot of fun. We did that in a little 16 foot boat. But here is where it comes into the Willamette. Now, normally I would recommend turning right and going up the Willamette River into Portland. There, it's very interesting. You go through, uh, through all the bridges. This, this is the, the main part of the downtown of Portland. And, and right here at, at the Hawthorne Bridge is, is a very pleasant marina called the River Place. Unfortunately, uh, Portland is, is having a great deal of so social turmoil these days. And the worst part of that is, is right here in Southwest Portland. So at this point, if I was doing it, I think I would recommend uh, staying, uh, going back out to the Columbia at this point. So even if you take the Multnomah Channel, go down a, a mile or two, catch the Columbia and come up here. Uh, Hayden Island is here. For those of us who have driven through there, uh, this is the I-5 corridor. Oh, no, excuse me, this is the I-5 corridor right here. So that's, that's the big bridge over the Columbia. But here at uh, Tomahawk Island, Island, there's a, a bunch of marinas and, and some chandleries and stuff. And then this whole area over here is all a great big mall. So if you need a shopping fix, that's the place to get it. So if you don't want a city experience at all, you can go on up the river a couple of more miles to Government Island, which is a, a park. That's right here. And there's some 
some nice public docks there. And this, this island is a place where you can run your dogs and take a walk and have a pleasant time. Now, once you leave that part of, of the river, as Jerry was saying, the river changes its character dramatically. And this is one place where it does it because you enter into the Columbia Gorge. And for those who aren't familiar with the term, a, a gorge is, a, is, is deeper than it is wide. A canyon is wider than it is deep. But you can see that, that there's some steep topography here on both sides of the river. And uh, so all of a sudden you leave what's basically fairly flat lands down here in the Portland area and get into where you're, you've got towering cliffs on, on the sides of the river. So from Government Island up to, to uh, Beacon Rock is a, is a very pleasant trip. Uh, Beacon Rock is really famous. This was a, a place where Lewis and Clark camped. It's a very tall pinnacle that you can actually climb up it if you're willing to climb a thousand steps. It is shallow and it's narrow in here, but there's a, a dock here. Those of you, you who got the, uh, the early notice I sent out, I, I wrote a description about our crash landing at the, there one time. It was early spring and there was a lot of flow coming down from, this, from the snow-capped peaks and we uh, had a very exciting landing there. And then when we left that time, you'll see that this was our track at that point. And there was actually places, the, the water was running so hard at that point, we had the main engine and the wing engine both at wide open throttle. And we were making about a knot or maybe a knot and a half. And you can see that according to the chart, we were actually running on the land <laughs> in some places. But we, at one point we were racing a fisherman who was sitting on the bank and, and he won for quite a while, but I finally beat him. But this is a narrow area. It's got a lot of current, a lot of whirlpools, and it's it's a it's not some place you're going to go through quickly. Then this is Bonneville Dam, which is your the first dam you'll hit, and it'll be your first experience with a lock. So this is the locks right here. Uh, you want to call the lock master in advance, give him a little notice that you're coming, so that he can schedule you in. They're not going to open the, the lock typically for a pleasure boat uh, unless they are wanting to get rid of water. In the spring they're dumping water anyway so they're happy to, to open up and let, let you through. But more typically they'll ask you to tie up. There's some, uh, some docks up in here you can side tie to and they'll wait for some commercial traffic to come through and what they'll often do is they'll load the dock with, with a tug and barge or, or a, a ship or something, and then have you go in and tie off to the ship instead of to the side. But if you, uh, if you are going in where you have a side tie, it's very easy. Uh, Jerry, why don't you talk about that? Because you've done it with a small boat. Tell us what your experience was. Yeah, there's, a, there's eight major dams on this river. Bonneville is the lowest one, and it's um, it's one of the oldest ones. Um, and they all work the same. They're all run by the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, you call them on channel 14, channel 14. And they appreciate uh, 15, 20 minute notice of what your intentions are. And you asked what I do is I call them the lockmaster. And uh, I ask them what's the chances of, uh, you know, getting locked through. I'm, I'm going up uphill or downhill, whatever. And he'll ask what size of boat you have. And my boat's a little one, it's a 25 foot cruiser. And, uh, and he'll, he'll give you instructions. In a, in a regular summertime, there's a pecking order. Government vessels are number one through no matter what. Commercial vessel deep draft vessels are number two. And then pleasure crafts are number three. Uh, sometimes um, some of the dams will actually have uh, reserve hours for those different classes. Uh, you may have to wait till, you know, certain between 10 and three in the, in the afternoon or something to go through. Uh, after Labor Day, uh, they don't do that. Uh, there's, the traffic is reduced a lot. Uh, it's a lot more relaxed and they'll usually squeeze you through uh, uh, as quick as they can. Uh, the locks 
are, as Doug said, are really, really easy. Uh, they're the most modern locks. And by the way, they are the highest lifting locks in the entire nation. Uh, all of them are 100 feet plus or minus a little bit. And uh, they have uh, like maybe six different tie-up points inside each lock, th you know, three or four on each side. And what you see is a metal track running vertically in the concrete and then trapped in that track is like a large drum, like a half of a 50 gallon oil drum with a big bollard on it, it's all steel. And it floats on the water level and it goes up and down that track as the water come, fills in the lock or goes out of the lock. So you just simply motor up to them and the lock master will uh, you know, help you figure out which one you want and all that stuff. And uh, you put a four, four and a half spring line with a, with a deli around the, the bollard and I just pull those in a little bit. And uh, other, other than that, all you need is a couple of fenders to keep you off the, off the uh, concrete wall. I like ball fenders because they have a very small contact patch and they skip up and down real easy. And you just uh, pull that in kind of snug, call a lock master and tell him you think you're ready. And he says, okay. And, and uh, he'll say, you know, give me a call on the radio if you need, if, uh, you need anything or want us to stop. You know, they're really nice. And uh, pretty soon, you know, you'll, if you're going up, you'll start seeing all those bubbles and everything and like you do in a normal lock. And you just about 20 minutes to go 100 feet up and uh, away you go. And you just cast off those lines and, and motor on out. Like Doug said, sometimes it's, it's easiest for you just to tie up to a tug and a barge that's already in there. And those guys are really nice. And uh, everybody wants to have a good transect so there, there's there's no issues about that but all the locks are on channel 14 all eight of them on the entire lower columbia and the and the lower snake river uh, all the way to lewiston idaho so the first lock is a little bit of a learning experience but it's easy compared to any other lock i've been on and uh and once you get that down you're set so that's about it anything else i should mention there doug well, there's, there's two issues that, that bigger boats might need to be aware of. One is you don't want to tie too tight because you can, you can uh, especially if you're going down, your, ball, your, your, uh, your fenders may decide to, to stay up high and pretty soon they're, they're running free and you're trying to jam them back down between the hull and the, and the wall. So, so that can be an issue. Also, we uh, hung our kayaks on the outside of the rails of our boat deck and quickly learned that that was not a good idea because they became fenders as well. You never think about that when you're going to a regular dock, but uh, uh, you, you want to make sure there's nothing outside of, of your, uh, your gunnels when you're, when you're going up and down in the locks. So. Yeah, and the easiest, easiest way to do those, uh, to keep the fenders from, from uh, hanging up, is I, I snug up a little bit by hand. Like I said, I don't tie it off. I do a, a, a loop, one turn on each of those spring lines. And I pull them up kind of snug. And then as the water either comes in or, or goes out, I let it out like a half an inch at a time. And I watch what the boat's doing. And what you want those fenders to do is just kind of skip along as you're going up. And they'll talk to you. And we you can tell when you got it right. If you let out too much line, the boat will kind of oscillate. And that's a whole lot of work and you don't want that to happen. Uh, but um, you get a feel for it that first time. And it's a lot easier to let the line out when your boat's going up or down and it is trying to take it back. So that's why I always get up pretty snug and then slowly let out about a half an inch at a time till oh, there's a sweet spot. That's where I wanna be. And by the way, you have to wear a life jacket when you go through the locks, PFD of some kind. Now that's why yeah, that we don't agree, Jerry, because if you if you have your bow and your stern line uh, tied to a single point, the bow the boat will tend to oscillate back and forth. And so what we would typically have is a, a crew member at the bow and at the stern. And if a fender started uh, crawling out of its position, you simply rotate the boat a little bit so it drops down and, and by by letting the boat rock back and forth, it it uh, made it easy to manage the fenders that way. Yeah, that and that's great. I usually go through single-handed, so I have to manage the boat and the and the lines, and I have much smaller boat. So, 
yeah, every boat has its own personality. But the other the other thing that, that Doug brought up is you got to think ahead a little bit. You don't want anything between your boat and a concrete wall that's going to be uh, in the way. So yeah. if, you, if you're carrying equipment or something, you want to do that. And also if you have an overhang, um, you, you know, a, a canopy or something, you know, you want to think about that. You have clearance. And if you don't, you need bigger fenders. So we spend a lot of time on the first lock. After the first one, they get a lot easier because uh, you know what you're doing. Now, the area above Bonneville, this gets into the real beautiful part of the Columbia Gorge. We go into the Bridge of the Gods. Cascade Locks is an interesting little place. We, we actually went in there, but it's very tiny. So you, if you get in and you want to stick your nose in, make sure there's room for you before you get committed because you may have to back out and go on. But just a couple of miles further up the river is Hood River. And this is a really nice port, especially for big boats. Let me see here, I'm, make sure I'm not outrunning myself. So Hood River is a, is a beautiful town. It's got a nice marina. Am I going too far? Oh, here it is. Okay. Now, it's also the windsurfing capital of the country, I think. And what that tells you is there's a lot of wind there because it, there's long fetches and they're coming through the gorge. And so it can get real choppy. So that's one issue is, is you know, there's times on, on the river when you'll see a chop. We've been in a six foot uh, swells on a, on a two second uh, period, which means your bow, bow is going up and smash and up and smash. It, it's a good time to get off the river if you can. But the other issue is that there's all these crazy windsurf windsurfers all through this area here. And as sail powered vessels, they have the right of way. So technically you're supposed to yield to them. In practicality, they go so fast that it's like mosquitoes. You just kind of <laughs> go on through and be prepared to do a crash stop if somebody falls right in front of you. But most of them can get back on their feet and zip away before you can even think about it. But there's a very nice marina here and the town itself is charming. There's a great aerospace, or not aerospace, but it's, it's a cars, tractors, and planes that is in the town that's very much, very worth seeing. So that's a great stop. It's really pretty there. Now upriver from that, the next major uh, port is the Dalles. And it's okay, but it's, it's not really ideal for bigger boats because they don't have a lot of room for, for anybody. And that's where you'll hit your second dam. Is here is the Dalles Dam, right here. So again, there's a there's locks. This is the locks on this side of here, and it's so you again you just enter in. You wait for the lock master to give you the go ahead, and and through you go. Above Bonneville, the, the river is primarily just a whole series of lakes. They, they've got the dams where they dam up the water almost clear to the lake. So there's a little bit of current below the, the dam, but not much. Now, when, at the Dalles, the world changes again. The, instead of being in this deep gorge, you can see that the, uh, that the land flattens out a whole lot and you're up in the high, high uh, wheat country here. Now there's there's one very pleasant anchorage here that you can, oops, hang on. I'm, I gotta remember how to run this thing. This is where we were coming down river and got into some very heavy winds uh, on the nose. So we were really happy to get into this air, uh, anchorage here and set, set our anchor. And this island, or this island is a, a good place to get a, go ashore and water your dogs and take a hike. Now I'm gonna move us along a little bit. We go through the John Day Dam, and then the next one is Mac, uh, Mac, what am I saying? McNary Dam. Oh, you ought to know about this place. This, this is a, a nice little marina. And this is a railroad track. And believe me, if you're here at night, when the trains come through, which is about once an hour, 
you're going to know there's a train coming because there's a crossing right here. And so they blow their whistles long and loud to make sure nobody uh, is in their way. And, and as a boater, you'd think they're coming right over the top of you because they're about 100 feet away. So it, it's an exciting moment. There's also a stop at Boardman, which is a little further up here. But I'm going to skip us on up to the Tri-Cities because we're already looking like we're going to run out of time and we're still on the Columbia River here. So, But I will mention Crow Butte is a state park and it's a very pleasant spot to go in and, and there's a good anchorage back here. There's no docks big enough for anything but a very small boat, but uh, it's easy anchorage and it's a it, up in this area, you're mostly in, in the desert at this point. So this is being all watered is, is a pleasant green, a uh, little spot of green in the middle of, of a lot of brown. And this is Boardman here. Let's just go on up here a little ways here. Okay, so now the river takes a, a big turn to the north. And this is where the Snake River comes in. This is the snake coming down here. This is the uh, Columbia coming down here. And it, the Columbia is not navigable uh, very far up this river. You can see that we went up to just to explore a little ways, but it's, it's really uh, not a place that you can, can navigate. But Jerry, tell us about, uh, about Richland and, and uh, Kennewick a little bit, if you would. Yeah, this is a great, great place to stop for a couple of days. Um, they call it Tri-Cities. There's really three little townships that are all adjacent to each other. The Columbia River goes north up here and goes clear up into Canada. It's amazing uh, how big this river really is. But there's a dam uh, up there a ways. Uh, and like, like Doug said, you, uh, it, it, you don't have a lock. And uh, so it, it's, it, it only goes so far. Second power lines up is about as far as I went. But uh, to the left of that channel is a giant government reservation and it's called Hanford. And that's where all of the atomic energy uh, was produced to build the atomic bombs in World War II. And there's a lot of history there about that. And there was also a lot of dumping of uh, uh, refuse during the war uh, and, and storage of, of uh, contaminated materials. And uh, it was all off, uh, you know, not available to the public to go on that reservation. So it, it, it's, it's interesting. And in one sense, um, it's a garbage dump of bad stuff. And in the other sense, it's a wildlife reserve because nobody's in there and, and the wildlife are happy as can be uh, running around. So there's lots to see. Right now, there's about three and a half billion dollars a year being spent cleaning this up. And there's a huge amount of immigration that came in of PhDs and uh, engineers and their families and they all wanted nice homes and there's multi-million dollar homes on the north side of the of the reach here and uh, uh, really beautiful with docks and everything you could think of and on the south side are uh, a, a green belt walkway of parks that extend for about eight miles and it's all brand new state-of-the-art uh, bronze statues of Sacagawea and all that kind of stuff, well interpreted. And uh, there's so much money pouring in there, all these people that moved to, to do this, uh, you know, 30 year cleanup project, wanted a nice schools and universities for their kids and wanted a new hospital, so they just build them. So it's, it's pretty well booming. And there's also a lot of wineries in this in this area and uh, winery tours and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a fun place to be. The mooring facilities at, at, uh, at Tri-Cities is first rate, it's all brand new, aluminum, everything, and uh, very inexpensive. I was amazed, they gave me a little grab bag uh, when I signed up and, and the stuff in that bag I got as a souvenir was worth more than the, than the fees that I had for mooring. But there's yacht clubs here. If you've got reciprocity, uh, they'll take care of you. And it's just really nice. So that's one you want. You you definitely want to poke around in a little bit. Um, 
the, the other issue is, is this is where you split off and you go straight north and, and end up heading towards Idaho. And then you're in the lower Snake River, which is an, another major uh, waterway. And by the way, just so you know, the, the Columbia River was one of the marvels of, of the world. Uh, the Missoula floods actually occurred a, a series of like 10 of them or more. Uh, it was the, the amount of water coming down uh, about 15,000 years ago uh, was equivalent to all of the world's waterways and rivers, all of the, in the entire earth combined. Uh, that's how much water came down here when the ice dam broke uh, from, and had all this water pouring down. The water, the speed of the water was over 80 miles per hour. And that's what carved these gorges and channel lands and all of that. So it, it's very, very interesting. And to this day, it's, it's the largest river drainage in North and South America into the Pacific and navigable all the way to Idaho. Gary, but, uh, yes. you mentioned on the, on the Missoula floods, um, there was a large lake and ice dams. How many times did they think that that flood happened? They think a minimum of 10, but the, le the latest, you know, look, looking at the, at, the, at the different layers of silt and stuff downstream from each event, they're now thinking of maybe 40 times. And uh, what, what would happen, it was a, sort of an oscillator. Um, it was during the ice age and all that water evaporated out of the sea and came down and, and made a sheet of ice five miles thick from uh, you know Canada all the way down into the northern parts of the United States. And it there was an impoundment at, in, near Missoula um, and a giant lake. And it was blocked by this ice sheet. And at a certain period when it's just started to warm up, the ice sheet um, would blow out on the bottom and this huge volume of water would come down. And then it would plug up a little bit and then it start building up and it would, it would just keep repeating that, it's like say like an oscillator. But when you go through this river and look at the geography, it is absolutely spectacular. There's every kind of geology you've ever seen in your life. And it changes, as Doug was saying, the mood of the river changes as you go on up and down. And uh, I, I like doing it on a slow bell. I did it in my little 22 foot sailboat at uh, four knots and I took a month and I loved it. And uh, it, it's, it's a great trip. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that if you did it, if you chose to do this trip, it would, it would be something you'd remember for the rest of your life. Yes, it really is a spectacular uh, trip. And so, so at this point, the river is, is pretty lazy. And then you start up the Snake River and it is very different. It's like, it's, it's truly a different river. It's smaller, it's narrower, it's shallower. The dredging problems are serious here, but uh, it's just beautiful. And uh, you get into some deep canyons. It's really pretty, very pretty. So the first dam is Ice, Ice Harbor is right here. And then you work your way up. Uh, we. We had a very pleasant stop here at Fishhook Park, which is a county park, but it's got nice docks and it's a pleasant place to spend a, a day or several. I'd really encourage you to consider taking this trip slowly, you know, take some time and see things. But there's, a, there's four dams in the Columbia, there's four dams on the Snake. And typically you're, you're not gonna do more than one dam a day, even if you're in a hurry. Now coming down river, especially after Labor Day, you might be able to do two dams in a day, but it, it's not easy. But it's very pretty country going up this, this snake. There's, a, there's one area I want to point out to you. It's right here. This is the Palouse. The Palouse River comes down here. If you've got an idle moment, uh, Google for Palouse Falls kayak jumpers. There was this kid that there's a huge falls up here and he went over it in his kayak and it, it, it it's pretty interesting if you like to see young guys who are immortal do stupid stuff 
<laughs> I will warn you, however, that although this looks as though it's navigable, see, it looks like it's, you've got pretty good depth. This is in feet, not in fathoms, but that's good, good depth. But the fact is when I went up there to check it out in the dinghy, by the time I got about this far up, I was dragging mud uh, off the prop of, of the dinghy. So this whole thing is silted in at this point. And that's true of an awful lot of places. So you really do have to be careful here. However, there is a, a good uh, spot to stop right in here. So what we did is we stopped there and then we got a local to drive us up to Pulu's Falls to see it. It was very pretty. You'll notice again that we have statute miles marked here, although this is starting from the Columbia, not from the Columbia Bar, but from where the, the mouth of the snake. So it's a few days travel to, to go up, up all the way to Lewiston, Idaho. So let me just skip on up there. <clears throat> like I say, there's four dams. I can zoom out here and get there a little faster. It's, it's further than you, you'd think. Okay, so here's here's where it starts uh, getting back into more civilization. There, mo there's hardly any towns uh, you go through up to this point. So this is Clarkston, which is Washington. This is Lewiston, which is Idaho. So the, the border is, is right here. And uh, the problem is you, you cross the state line now, being old Idahoans, of course, we were singing, the, and here we have Idaho over the loud hailer and blowing the horns and things, but they didn't get the memo. They didn't have a band or flags or anything for us. But once you get there, you can't go anywhere. The Clearwater River is only navigable for about a, a mile, and that's if the bridge, uh, the bridge here is open. And there's a drawbridge right here which is broken or was when we went through. So we couldn't go any further up river than that. So basically we came into Idaho, turned around and went back to Rooster's restaurant, which had a very nice uh, dock there and, and good margaritas and, and the celebratory uh, uh, enchiladas. So that was very nice. Then there's a marina near there too. I think right in here is the marina. So that's, that's, this here is a basically milepost 425 when you're coming up from the, from the ocean. However, you can go further uh, by jet boat. And it's something that if, you, if you're up there, I would strongly recommend. It's very exciting. Uh, the jet boat we rode had twin Volvo engines. They were, they were jets. And the guy could literally come up to about a six foot standing wall of water and gun it and just blast over the top of it, soaking everybody in the boat in the process. It's really fun. So you can go a long ways up the river. Uh, it ch it's not charted very far because it's not navigable, but it's a, it's a real experience to do that too. So we spent a week or 10 days up here touring around. Family came up and visited and then we turned around and headed back down and it's, this, it's easier going down. You know what, what you're doing. You've got the current with you. Uh, so it's, it's a little faster trip. So. And Douglas and Jerry, where did you find fuel? Because most boats will need fuel. Was that pretty um, stop in the marinas? You can get fuel for it fairly easily on the, on the ways? Well, yeah, we were in Nordhaven, so we didn't worry about that. We fueled in Portland and we fueled again in Portland. But there is gas and, and diesel available pretty regularly. You know better than me, Jerry. Tell me your experience. Yeah, yeah the, the fuel is no problem in either groceries or ice or any of that stuff. And if you've got this cruising atlas, um, there's phone numbers and identification of facilities. And it'll tell you, um, you know, Marina A, gas, food, milk, groceries, whatever it is, mooring, all that stuff. And uh, it's really, really easy. And the best time to, to be on the river actually is uh, right after Labor, Labor Day because the traffic is at minimum, kids are back in school. 
and uh, it's more laid back and it's not quite as warm. It's pretty warm in that canyon in the summer. Uh, setting that aside though, uh, Lewis and Lewiston and Clarkston, uh, those two towns that are side by side that, on the chart, th those are named after uh, Lewis and Clark expedition that uh, most all of us know about. But uh, they came over those Idaho mountains on horseback and, uh, and spent a while with the Nez Perce Indians and then uh, chopped down a bunch of trees and made dugout canoes. And they put in up on the uh, on that to the right there about uh, probably about 40 miles upstream from here. They put in and they did, did the entire river, just like we described, all the way to Astoria. And uh, it was an epic journey. And there's been quite a bit written about it. But my theory is if those guys could do that, paddle a cut, cut open log wearing leather clothes, uh, without any dams to modify anything and make nice, pleasant lakes. And a lot of it was white water all the way back then. Uh, then I can certainly do it, uh, <laughs> do it as nice as it is right now, everything well marked and, and good to go. The other thing about doing it later in the year is that the state, a lot of the state parks close. Uh, it's a soft closure. It's not a big deal. They usually close the highway entry off and lock the bathrooms so they don't have to deal with them till next season. But they're all uh, uh, accessible by the water. They, they don't close off the docks. And uh, it's really nice to have your own state park. And you can tie up and pick, pick your best spot and walk around and all that green grass and, and whatever picnic table you want or, or whatever. And there, there's a few other boaters doing the same thing, but it's very relaxed and very low key as opposed to water skiers and kids and uh, all that stuff. So you've got variations of the river, variations of the topography and the geology, variations in your navigation and going up, down, and around, and around, and variations in the people that you meet, and variations in the temperature and, and the, the weather conditions. It just makes for a really terrific once-in-a-lifetime experience. I try to do it every couple of years. In fact, I was going to do it last year, and uh, because of COVID, uh, I, I ended up not going. But it's on my list, and I'm hoping I, I can uh, I, I can do it again this year. I'm really looking forward to it. So, so the river is is navigable. The, there's small cruise ships come up the river, so you, big boats can do it uh, easily. Uh, so can little boats. We, we met one fellow who was following the Lewis and Clark Trail, and he was rowing a little uh, catamaran gadget that they make for fishermen that was a, maybe an eight-foot boat. The, the one problem he had it was that the locks won't allow you to go through if you don't have a motor. So he had a tiny little electric motor for his thing so he could go through. Uh, uh, through the locks because otherwise you'd have to deflate the thing and carry it around the dam and put it back in the water so but it's very very doable uh, like i say we went up in a 46 and it it was fine some of the docks uh, were a little iffy places i i wouldn't have trusted the cleats to to hold us in a wind or anything so we we anchored a lot but uh, there are some places where you can go into these marinas and they will do everything they can to to make it easy for you. They're so excited to have, you know, people come through. It's, it's just, a, they're very welcoming. Well, Terry and Douglas, you've really shared the, the river areas with us. I don't see any questions in the Q and A, but we still have some participants. If they have questions for you, or if they want to email, um, email uh, cruising stations at ssca.org, um, we can forward those on to you. Did you want to continue do anything going back or? I think that we've run over our hour yeah. at this point. And so as going back down is, is uh, very similar to going up. We, like I say, we took two months going up and a month going back. We, it was much different experience going down in the late summer instead of the early spring. But that's and going downhill is easy. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, I just asked Charles Wardle. I see him in there as a um, observer. 
I just let him come in if he wants to say something. But what I'll do is drop the screen share then. And um, Charles probably doesn't know he's he can talk. But I wanted to thank you guys very much. You've uh, really certainly given us a lot to think about. We will have this on YouTube. It's already on YouTube. There's Charles. Um, you can say something, Charles, because Doug and Jerry are both looking at your name. Yes, and uh, we all went to high school together. Oh, a family yeah. reunion. Yeah, it is. I was curious about one thing as you're going up and down the stretches of the river. If you have a mechanical casualty or something like that and, and you find yourself adrift and you're trying to catch an anchor, uh, are there any kind of services that uh, can pull you out of a jam? Well, there's Boat U.S. Uh, are operating all around the population centers. But, you know, it, it, as you know, Chuck, it's, it, it's the West. And the manners yeah. are, you know, you, you take care of people that need it. You can flag somebody down in a sport fishing boat or whatever. And nine times out of 10, they'll come over and say, well, you know, can I help you? So it, 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 it's pretty, I don't, I don't get very anxious about it. And, uh, you know, all of us try to have our equipment top notch and have some redundancy. I don't like being on a Columbia River without, without a spare engine. And my little kicker takes care of that. But um, I, I don't think it's anything at all that, that you would need any anxiety about. And then any of these towns have, uh, you can go to the nearest marina and uh, you can hitchhike or, or get a cab or whatever it is. And, and they'll, they'll tell you, if, you know, what, where the machine shop is or if you need a, a part or whatever. You, you, you might have to wait a day, but, uh, you know, you can get one real quick and, and you're good to go. Jerry. Yeah. A lot of John Deere equipment out in that country, so people know how to work on diesels. <laughs> and there's a lot of boats, a lot of you know runabouts, so they know how to work on outboards. Now I invited in two more people. Uh, Murray Birch has a question. We have a North Haven 63 with seven foot draft. Any any questions? Thanks. And Murray, you can actually unmute and talk directly. And if anyone's on the screen and you have mute up, you can actually talk. Well, Mur Murray, I, I, I welcome. We've met uh, in the past ourselves. Uh, a boat your size would be fine going up. You, you'd you have to be a little more cautious than than the, the smaller boats because you do have a deeper draft. But uh, and you'd probably end up anchoring more because, uh, like I say, a lot of the marinas are, are more set up for for the sport boats and you know the smaller boats than than boats the size of our Nordhavens, but there, I would certainly encourage you to go up there anyway. It's you, you'd be fine doing it. And the entire channel is is dredged and channel marked for deep draft vessels for tugboats pushing eight sixteen barges, uh, going through all of those locks and and working up. So as long as you're uh, in the main channel. Um, you wouldn't have any problem at all. Well, Jerry and Doug, thank you. Charles, thank you for your comments. Murray, thank you for your question. Um, unfortunately, people on YouTube can't ask any questions and I can't see them, So, um, but we know they're there. This will be posted. We'll probably break it into two sections and I wanna thank you both. This has been um, a, a lot of fun and a great learning experience, I think, um, to use Zoom and get things coordinated. And I want to thank you all very much. Well, you're sure welcome. And Good to see you two guys up on this. It's been great to uh, to do do a project with you like this. Well, oh, and by you. the way, Chuck Chuck Wardle was uh, one one of my sister's uh, best boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send say goodnight on that. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd love to jump on that one. <laughs>